Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the NFPC. Uh, I'm Carl Turner. I work for Parker in the UK. As you know, Parker is mainly famous for obviously its hydraulics, pneumatics, and that side of things. And you'll obviously see that from the wall downstairs, sort of our some of our history. One of the areas that we find that technology oh. is no moving into uh, is electronic control of hydraulic systems. Um, even just in the short time I've been with Parker, the 14 years, I've seen it change tremendously. I'm still slightly scared of it. However, Parker brings on people like Tim, who's going to go through this, um, to run through the electronic control side of things and the uh, systems to not only help ourselves, but our customers. So I'm going to hand over to Tim. He'll go through the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name's Tim. Um, I've been Parker for... 20 years, 20 years last year actually, so fair fair amount of time. Predominantly, my background is electromechanical, um, so electrical, electromechanical systems, servos, steppers, all the mechanics, the, all the control loops, the control systems, the programming, all that side of it. Um, so I bring that to the hydraulic side, which um, I've been responsible for now for probably a little over a year. Um, but it's all pretty much the same, right? So, what could go wrong, right? <laughs> okay, so, before we go too much further, I want to ask you all a question, okay? Who remembers their first car, the first car you owned? Show of hands, anyone? Okay, yeah. Now, looking around the room, without being too disparaging, I reckon some of them might have been 70s, maybe even 60s. I don't Possibly, okay. The point is, your first car, what did you like about it? It was simple, right? It was simple, it was just an engine in the back. Plenty, Hard, of, room to work on plenty it. of room to work on it, hardly any electronics, or that horrible electronic stuff. You know, there was no, um, it, well, no, no ABS, no um, mirrors, windows, you know, air conditioning, none of that. Maybe hot and cold if you were lucky. Demist occasionally, you know, none of that. But it was simple. So the point here is, a lot of you remember the simplicity of your first car. You know, it was easy to work on. That's the first thing you, you know you said. That's, and a lot of people like that about hydraulic systems. It's easy to work on. They don't like all the all the add-ons. But you know, like I said, what didn't you have? You only had four gears, four-star petrol. You know, seat belts were, there weren't any in the back, were there? Not even headrests, you know. It was, so it was not all good, okay? But I take the point, it was simple. Okay, is that anyone's first car? <laughs> it's not, that's not my first car, I must concede. <coughs> Would have been nice if it was, but that actually was <coughs> my first car. Anyone recognise that? Anyone? Is you that can tell me what that is. No? No? Fiat, Fiat 850 Sport. That was my first car. Rusted away. Was a Fiat after all. What do you expect? Russian, Russian steel. Man. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So yeah, it's not all good. And it was slightly complicated by the fact that in this case the engine was in the boot, and it was kind of shoehorned in there. So it wasn't quite as simple for me to work on. But it was simple. There was none. Of, as I say, there was none of the gizmos that you have today. Manual choke, etc., etc. Started occasionally. You know, sometimes got me where I wanted to go. You know, simple, but simple is not always good. So where are we today? How have you travelled here today? You've all travelled in modern cars, I'm guessing. But now we enjoy such lovely features as sat-nav, um, lovely fuel economy, everything's automatic. You probably may even have heated seats, wing mirrors that retract and automatically adjust, your wipers, your lights, they all come on automatically. Everything's marvellous, you know. Would you really go back to the, the simple first car? Don't know about that. You might, maybe some of you would, but you know, there's a lot of benefits. There's a lot of benefits of safety, airbags, all of that. It's all good stuff, okay, which you'll kind of take for granted now. You know, you might not like it, but uh, the electronics, but you do take it for granted, and we have moved on. You're a lot safer, you're a lot more comfortable. And the future, staying with the car thing, it's not all about cars, this, uh, this presentation, okay, probably be more interested than it was, but no, the, I do will get to the point in a minute. If we look at the future, okay, I don't know how many of you saw um, 
Top Gear on the weekend, but even Jeremy Clarkson admits that the hybrid vehicle is the way forward. That is the future. That's the way it's going. Even Mr. Clarkson admits that. So we're not only talking about controlling all of the bits around the side, all the safety features, all the functions, all the switches, the comfort. We're also talking about replacing the engine. We're talking about ultimately replacing it completely, albeit this is a hybrid, so you've got a combustion engine and an electronic motor. But ultimately, we're talking about electronic solutions throughout. And that's just the car industry. Right, that's it for cars, okay, for now. And hydraulics. So where does this, where, where does this lead to with hydraulics? Well, hydraulics is just the same, okay? Traditionally, hydraulics has been an industry where there's not been so much electronic control. There's been a reluctance. Probably there's a lot of, uh, dare I say, slightly older hydraulics engineers that know hydraulic systems very well. They're slightly reluctant to get involved with the higher end electronic control. However, it's inescapable. Electronic control is the future of hydraulics, okay? That, that's the way it's going. It's, and it's good, it's good. Well, I hope you think it's good. It, allow, it opens up all sorts of opportunities for us. It's, it provides opportunities for cost savings, advancements in applications, etc., etc. And these are just a, a whole bunch of typical applications that, uh, where hydraulics would be used and electronic hydraulic control can be employed. So, in this presentation, the idea is, uh, as I hope to provide you with a clear understanding of where and why intelligent control is used and is essential in today's hydraulic systems. Okay? So, good reasons for complexity. Why, why do we need electronics? Well, number one, maximised efficiency, energy savings. That's the key driver, right? Everyone wants to save money. We have limited resource. We want to save money. We want to save resource. Energy saving. Top of the top of the pile there. Improved accuracy and repeatability with, with the feedback systems available to us, with the control loops available to us. We can be far more accurate. We can be far more repeatable than <coughs> what we do with hydraulic systems. This is old hat yeah. technology in many respects, but it's just it's, it's it's coming forward in leaps and bounds, and in the electromechanical world, that's all we do. Better optimized and tuned systems. Again, this leads into better performing applications because they're, they're tuned. We have very fast active control loops we can work with. We have a whole range of information we can take and we can manipulate. Improved safety. Safety is a big driver. Electronics has helped immensely in the safety of in industry and in hydraulics it's no different. Seal rated safety systems for example. Um, all of the light guarding, all of the automa automa automated uh, systems which uh, allow us to implement better safe practice. Increased process complexity. So we can have uh, very advanced applications that we can work on now. I've worked on applications for example with uh, very accurate uh, force mapping profiles for um, an application where they needed to repeat this and then work on the engine efficiency. But rather than running the whole system, we just map the force very accurately using a profile. And with that, they're able to just continually repeat the process and um, test their engine. But the other applications in the past we wouldn't have been able to look at. You, you wouldn't have been able to map that so with such complexity. Reduce setup times. Electronic systems allow us to uh, implement solutions um, quicker because we are, a we are able to um, set up systems, uh, program systems, we're able to repeat systems, um, and we're able to reduce the setup times with digital, digital components. Okay which are hot swappable. Reduced downtime, which kind of leads into the, the previous point as well. So we, with digital um, products, we're able to reduce setup times and downtime. Linked systems, mixed technologies. So we're not just talking about hydraulics, we're talking about a whole system. So you may have a system with a uh, certain amount of hydraulics, a certain amount of uh, electromechanics, 
a certain amount of pneumatics in a factory typically. The whole thing's linked. We don't want we don't want a situation where you got the electromechanics is all talking nicely to the PLC, which probably is running it if you're talking about a factory. Uh, maybe even the pneumatics is. Uh, well, that's not always the case. Uh, and the hydraulics is not talking. It's out on a limb. It's just run by I/O. We want to be able to talk to the whole lot. Everything needs to talk to each other. Okay. Electronics allows us to have linked systems, mixed technologies, remote access. So we don't need to be. A lot of our applications are mobile. For example, you know, we don't have to, to travel out to the depths of a Swedish forest in winter to fault find on a forestry machine. We can do that from the comfort of our office. We can remotely access it, we can diagnose, we can program, we can download new firmware, enhancements and things and such like. Real-time monitoring and trend analysis. So we can take all this information, we can monitor it, we can, we can work out what's going on. And that's all useful stuff for us, improving the applications. Even scheduled maintenance, we can, we can program in maintenance schedules so that this, we can intelligently predict when we're going to need to change things. Um, we can monitor things, we can monitor torque levels, force levels, things such as this. And based on the information we're getting back, we can know when things are about to fail. So we can schedule in maintenance. That's all going to help with your downtimes as well. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about um, the benefits uh, of um, electronics in hydraulics. So how are we going to achieve this? What do we need to put into our systems? Well, there's a good example. A variable speed hydraulic pump. Okay? That's, that's, very, that's a very simple example. Not so simple, I suppose, when you talk about the control loops. But what I'm saying is uh, all we're doing is there is replacing a fixed speed pump which is delivering effectively the maximum power you're ever going to need from your system. And we're going to stick a variable speed hydraulic pump in there that reacts to the actual requirements of the system rather than the peak requirements. You're easily going to be saved 20% plus uh, if you replace a fixed speed <coughs> pump with a variable speed solution. Straight off, the, straight off you're going to 20% and above, no problem at all. Mode and remote access we talked about, so we can remotely log into um, bits of kit. Uh, sensors and feedback systems, so we need those. All that information that is out there in your systems, we need to be able to get hold of that, bring it back to our control and do something with it. Okay. Diagnostics, once we've got that information, we need to be able to diagnose what's going on. We need to be able to look at the information in graphs and, and monitor it and decide what we need to do to improve the situation, for example. Data logging, same thing. So we can log all that data, we can hold it, and, and then we can ex extract it and use that data. All this information is going to come back to controllers. So we need controllers in there, okay? Be those hydraulics controllers, system controllers. We're not talking about hydraulic controllers today. So we need a controller that's able to take that information, do something with it. Integrated components. We need a whole range of integrated components, again, that we can talk to, that we can, we can interact with, we can control. So we need a range of integrated components that are ready, readily available. HMIs, displays, touch screens, smartphone apps. You've probably all got, most of you have probably got a smartphone. Um, most of your kids have, anyway. And um, they expect to be able to, they expect to be able to talk to, uh, electronic equipment with their, with their smartphones. They expect to be able to have apps that do it. So we need to do the same. We need to have kit that, that can talk um, to smartphone applications. The MD4, you, which is, there's a little display out there which I set up yesterday, that accepts a smartphone app, for example. So you can, you can upload and download stuff to that by your iPhone, okay? That's gonna sit in a cab somewhere, out in the forest somewhere, you know, in an IP65 full touch screen. You know, again, that's expected. That, you know, in today's world, touch screen is, is expected. They don't, want, they don't want clunky buttons anymore. I quite like clunky buttons, but they don't want clunky buttons. They want touch screens, okay? So we need to, we need to be up, up with that. So we need to supply those kind of systems. Hydraulics is no different to anything else. Safety, we've already talked about a little bit, so we need to implement all the safety systems. 
um, such as seal rated IO, for example, and all of the bus systems. We need to be able to talk to all those bus systems. One way or another, we need to talk over J39 CAN, which is the industry standard mobile CAN protocol that we use, Profinet, EtherCAT, PowerLink, Profibus, you name it. We need to interface with all those bus systems. We need to talk. Okay? And just looking around here, so these are all components which feature in the points that I've raised there. So we've got a modem there, we've got some uh, sensors, we've got some expanded, uh, an expansion unit, more sensors, uh, joysticks, which we need to interface. That there is a CAN tilt sensor, which allows us to monitor X and Y motion. That's for a mobile industry, you need to know if you're gonna, things are going to fall over, so that's a useful piece of kit. Pedals, I, seal rated I.O., that's an LC6 joystick, which again you'll see featured on the, um, the display just on the stairwell there. That's, that's got a, an extra, I don't know if you notice there, it's got an extra rotary dial, which gives you a, a fourth function. Um, diagnostic equipment, I've seen some of that down on display. That's the sensor control diagnostic equipment. So your field guides can go out there and diagnose very quickly. Sometimes they do need to go, they can't do everything remotely. Um, but we need to be able to interface with kit very easily data log, take that back and, and work out what the situation is. That there is a forerunner of the MD4 touchscreen controller, which I already talked about. And over here you can see one of our integrated vein pump servo motor solutions for a hydraulic pump. So this is what I'm going to be talking about, okay? This kind of system, these kind of components to improve your systems. So, drilling down into some of those points I've raised, so the first thing is um, optimize systems leading to <coughs> energy savings. Okay, that's a, that's a key driver. We want to save. We want to save energy. We want to save money. Okay, so as I said, variable speed hydraulic pump optimizes system performance. Pressure and flow is delivered as required, and you get the exact power that you require in the cycle. So you're not. This is maybe a typical cycle, so we're, we're monitoring the power requirements within the cycle and delivering it where and when it's needed. And we achieve this by a very fast response, very fast tuned control loops, which are able to respond to the needs of the system and deliver the power that's required. Let's say typically you're talking 20% saving minimum there. And it's very easy. The other advantage, of course, of this type of system, it's, it's small, it's integrated, we can locate it where it's needed rather than where it's not needed, but where we can fit it. So we can be more localized with this kind of system. So it's a win-win, you know. This is gonna deliver you energy savings, it's gonna be a smaller package, um, and it's gonna, be, it's, it's, it's gonna deliver more optimized power where and when you need it in your system. Remote access. I actually live in Poole, so this is me on the beach in Sandbanks. So, uh, very nice. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's uh, it's like that all the time, really. It's, it's like that now. Sunny, Sun, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always sunny. <laughs> it's, a, it's always sunny. It's always sunny. Yeah. Um, so, remote access opens up online possibilities. So, um, as I said, we can we can we got a lot of our machines located in very remote um, environments, and um, we can link to them using a modem, we can get online, we can diagnose. So this, is, this opens up uh, a lot of possibilities for reacting to customer needs very, very quickly. Whereas in the past, it would be, well, take the bit kit off and post it back, we'll have a look at it, get back, we're still doing the same thing. We can actually look at the application in real time, doing the job it, it's meant to be doing, and we can act upon that. So that, that, this opens up uh, a lot of opportunities for us. Real-time information opt improves performance, okay? So we can have real-time monitoring of torque, force, pressure, flow, position, speed, temperature, angle, levels, volume of flow, for example, and we can interface a video. All of these parts you see around the, around the edge here might be used for achieving that, okay? So we, could, so we have access to all this information. 
Um, and we have access to this information faster than we've ever had it before. If you look again, if you look at the, um, the demo unit out there, we've got a video on there, for example. Typically, that'd be used in the cab for looking behind, so you can look behind, reversing camera, okay? But that's all built into the controller. You're not talking about a separate thing. That's all built into the controller that's controlling the whole process. Link your camera in over Ethernet, away you go, okay? Then we've got all our joysticks, everything linked in. So real-time monitoring allows us to take this information and act upon it very, very quickly. Control optimizes performance, okay? So, control loops. This is the complicated bit, okay? I'm not going to go into too much detail. But this is actually a control loop from one of our servo systems. This here, this unit here is a, a Compax 3F, a fluid controller. This is the servo version of it. So this might be used typically, for example, in the, um, the vein pump application. Okay? So, and that vein pump application, we have three levels of um, offering, I suppose. We have an induction motor with a variable speed, uh, a variable speed driver, an induction motor, variable speed driver, with a PMAC motor, and we go right up to a servo, full servo offering, servo motor, high end. And these are the control loops we're looking at. So we, we, we these are the set points, position, speed, acceleration, and jerk on the side. Here we have feedback uh, information coming back, so you can see velocity and acceleration coming back there. And we have a filtering and um, bandwidth limiting, etc. And we have proportional control, proportional functions there for increasing performance, etc. Okay, so these are the control loops behind what you see. This is a servo system, as I say, a servo elect electronic system. But if we if we now look at the control loop from this system you're looking at right here, then you can see it's very similar. We still have access to speed, uh, position speed, uh, acceleration and jerk values. Um, it's slightly different because we have an, uh, an additional control loop for uh, force mode. But um, it's this, you can see this, it, the same principles apply. So we're applying the same principles that we've been applying for many, many years with servo technology into servo pumps into servo fluid controllers. Um, and that's, as I say, that's exactly the control you, you see there. And these are very fast acting. As I say, you're talking 125 microsecond position, speed loops, and 62.5 microsecond force loops. So it's very, very quick. You know, we're getting that information in, in real time to all intents and purposes, and we're able to act upon it accordingly. And this is just a schematic sort of breakdown of the system you see, albeit we've got four valves rather than the one, which is the DF plus valve on there, on the system you see in front of you. Um, we see a hydraulic uh, pump system down here, and we see a hydraulic actuator, this one here, with a, with a transducer feedback device to give us the closed loop position control. Um, and so, so you have a system there which is very, very accurate, both in force and in position. We can, we can position that system to micron repeatability. Um, and it's down to the, the level of feedback, the level of control that we're able to apply to this system. Okay? Sorry about the photo there. So, um, again, looking at our mobile application, so all of that, that level of control that we talked about, those control loops that we talked about, they're all behind this. You don't see it, you don't want to see it. Uh, but they're, they're working on optimizing your system, okay? So here we have um, obviously a joystick, the LC6 again. We have a very high resolution touchscreen uh, camera <coughs> looking behind us, and then we have the real application. But all that information coming back from these sensors, for example, coming back from the feedback from the positions as well. It's all being fed back to that controller and we're optimizing the system. So we have a fully optimized system that's uh, working for the benefit of the application. <coughs> Communication connects. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about control. We also need to communicate. So we need to talk to one another. So if we look at 
a, an example of a, of a system uh, the and how it might be set up. Um, here you see on the left side we've got a, a power, what we call a power PLMC. It's a motion PLC, okay, <coughs> also with a servo drive on it. That's connected to a linear servo motor in this case. Uh, standard servo motor also connected to a, a, a linear uh, motor connected to a servo drive. And then we have the fluid controller, such as you see before you there, uh, connected to a hydraulic system. Then we may have some expanded I.O. Then we may have some, this is the Modiflex, uh, Parker Modiflex um, pneumatic system, which might be running some grippers, for example. In this case, we're using CAN bus, but we could be using any bus. Any of the buses I've mentioned, CAN open, device nets, Ethercat, Ethernet, you name it, any of those buses. Um, we just need a, an interface card. They're all industry standard. We can link into them. Then we have a controller. So we've got a controller in there. Maybe some seal rated I.O. in addition. And this is automating the whole plant, talking across the whole plant. So we don't want a situation where the hydraulics is out on its own. It's not talking to anyone. Maybe a bit of I.O. in there. We want to talk to it. We want to, we want to communicate to it. We want that information that from the hydraulics, the same as we want from everything else, okay? So that's just one typical system. So, in order to take all this information, optimize it, we then need to do something with it. So we need software, okay? And there are powerful software solutions out there, readily available. Uh, this one on the, on the left here shows a screenshot from ICANN Design. That's the bespoke software Parker uses with the ICANN series of controllers, the mobile controllers. And that's specifically written for hydraulic applications. It's very intuitive, very easy for users to get to grips with and uh, work and, and realize their applications, their, their hydraulic applications. Industry standard, Codasys, IEC 61131. I don't know how many of you programs in, are in here, but that's an industry standard language. If you know if you know IEC, you'd be happy to pick this up and run with it. That's a software that's running in that drive there. So they're powerful tools. They enable us to take that information and realize very uh, complex applications, make them safer, make them more efficient, optimize them. And these are the software tools that we use to do that. So, looking at system solutions, finally. We've looked at all of the areas of uh, where we can benefit from control, all the information we need, how we take it, how quickly we take it, where we take it, what we do with it, what benefits it provides us. And what it gives us is a system solution. This is a mobile example, but it could equally be an industrial example. And if you see on this, in, on this example, we have a controller, we have sensors, we have uh, expansion modules, ground sensors, we have the joysticks, we have uh, the software and P PC compatible, we have all of the sensors, everything involved in this system is talking using hydraulics. Okay? It's all connected. It's all, it's all connected over bus systems, it's all using software to manipulate that information is a complete solution uh, and it enables you to um, have a much more expansive application than you've had in the past.